Welcome to Four Calling Birds. Honest conversations that give us all a voice. Four Calling Birds. May I introduce Hayley Clapham, voiceover artist and lover of spreadsheets. Covid probably took one look at Katie and went, I'm not going to fuck with this one. Stephen Carter Bailey, our resident agony uncle and Great British Bake Off Queen. And I'm, honestly, it was like getting a goodnight kiss from my mother. Natalie Spence, singer and actress, who sadly can't be with us this week, but has left us this little message. Hello, Bert. It's Natalie here, and unfortunately I can't be with you this week, as I am on my way to uh, Hollywood. Yep, I'm going to hang out with Katie. Uh, so have a great show. And uh, we'll chat to you next week for the finale of Four Calling Birds, Season 1. And me, Meredith Hepner Chapman. This week, I'm joined by Catherine Haber, MBE. And I can't even introduce her in a few short words. So let's get going. So today, here on Four Calling Birds... I am joined by the most special guest that I could wish for. She's pulling faces at me as I say that. That's because you've known me since before I was even in existence. As as I would say a twinkle in your mother's eye or your daddy. (laughs) I am joined today. Or was it just a smile? Or was it just a smile? This is going to be carnage. It was, um, (laughs) was it just a smile? Oh, I don't know. A a whimper? (laughs) A whimper? I hope it was more, more jovial than that. A celestial explosion. Look at me, I'm the product of a whimper. <laughs> I am joined today by Katie Haber, Catherine Haber, MBE. Just call me your Jewish mother. My Jewish mother. My Hollywood mama. No, Hollywood Jewish mama. My Hollywood Jewish mama. It's so brilliant to have you on here because when when I first interviewed you, we didn't actually have four calling birds. You were just going to be on a platform because I wanted your story to be told. So the fact that you're here on four calling birds, so all the birds get to talk about the interview, but also we're going to put your full story on our platform as well because it's to try and condense everything you've done. (laughs) We've tried, it's taken a whole pandemic. You've done so much and you've just found your books from school, Wickham Abbey. Even back then, you were an activist, a philanthropist, just someone that I think is years ahead of their, I said earlier, maybe is it because we've regressed, but I think, no, you were years ahead. You were fighting for the underdog and for women and your achievements in film. And then subsequently what led you to receive an MBE are just phenomenal and I'm not just saying that because I love you you're just one of the most incredible women in in film and you're British but you've lived in LA now since gosh there's so much to talk about the daughter of Jewish Jewish refugee immigrants but your father has the most incredible story you have the most incredible story of the Holocaust but today we are going to talk about from your arrival into the world of film really well I I, I think that um sadly my adventures in the film industry started uh, because of my father's suicide. You know, I was telling you about, you know, that my parents escaped escaped the Holocaust from Czechoslovakia and came to England in 1939, and where I was born in 1944. And uh, my parents, you know, escaped, but my the rest of my family didn't. And I spent most of my youth listening to my parents trying to find out what happened to their family in the Holocaust. You know, my uncle and my aunt and my cousin and my my grandmother and all the rest of it. And uh, they never, they never found out. And uh, they, my, my, my father was so devastated by the loss of his family that in 1962, he committed suicide because of it. Not, not, not because he, you know, he was, he was a survivor, but, it was sort of survivor's guilt and, and the fact that he was unable to help his, the rest of his family escape and all the rest of it. So in 1962, I was going to go to the School of Dramatic Art to study, believe it or not, uh, speech therapy. 
because I thought with speech therapy, I could teach the mods and the rockers how to get out of gang activities by learning how to communicate. <laughs> and I mean, and I think, don't know how that makes sense, but that. that but it does make sense. It absolutely does make sense. I mean, we, you spoke about your father's suicide. There wasn't the help for people back then. Things weren't spoken about. And, and actually, there's we, it's Mental Health Awareness Week this week, and we've spoken how actually talking about stuff um, and, and getting people to speak about stuff and vocalise things is one of the best things. So actually, again, ahead of your time. Well, I mean, yeah, I don't know if your listeners, you know, know who the mods and the rockers were. <laughs> of course. They were, they, were, they were the gangs of, you know, of, in England, you know, way back when, you know, in the 60s, the rockers were motorbikes and the mods were on the Vespers. You know, so I, I thought that I could bring them back to, you know, anyway, I had these ridiculous ideas. So I said, said, instead of my mother having to pay for my education for four years, I took a secretarial course and decided I wanted to be in the film business. And, and my first job in the film business was working for the rank organization in the design department. It was called Intra Design. That didn't last too long, except that uh, was, uh, you know, just a step in the right direction on the wrong direction. And then I started, I started working for a film, film producer, Ronald J. Kahn, and we, we made a film called uh, Prudence in the Pill. There was, there was, <laughs> there was not, not, not the most uh, wonderful film to, to, to remember, but uh, it was directed by um, Ronnie Neem, who's, who's head, head, head of BAFTA at the time. And then another movie called, oh, I can't, I can't remember that. It goes back too what? far. And there was the mumsy nanny, um, mumsy, mumsy nanny, something and girly, and girly, and that that was a, a, a film that uh, various people and sundry people are want, want asking me to uh, do a, an interview about it with, when it's being re released on DVD, and and, <laughs> I, and I, I claimed I claimed that, that I had nothing to do with it because I thought it was so <laughs> awful. Incredible though. So you were working at Rank. You've done a couple of films. Uh, Jimmy Swan called me up and said, you know, there's someone in town that I want you to meet. Are you available to meet a director who's looking for someone to work with him? And I said, I'm, you know, I'm not working for anyone at the moment because uh, the producer I was working with has gone back to America and, and I'm not doing anything. And he said, well, Sam Peckinpah is looking for an assistant. Uh, can you come and meet him? Uh, would you be interested in working for him? I said, who's Sam Peckinpah? <laughs> and, and then he told me about the Wild Bunch and all the rest of it. And I said, yes, I would be happy to. He said, well, I'll, I'll see if I can, I, I can arrange a meeting. So at that time, I, you know, for, for many, many years, I had been a huge, huge, huge tennis, uh, tennis fan and went to Wimbledon every year without fail. And so I was at Wimbledon watching the tennis and uh, I got a call from Jimmy Swan and said, can you come and see? No, I got a call from Sam, actually, uh, saying, can you come and meet me in half an hour in my office? And I said, well, I'm, I'm at Wimbledon at the moment, and it's going to take me more than half an hour to get into town on the train. And he said, well, forget about it. And, so, <laughs> and I said, sort of, uh, sort of, well, screw, screw him. And I continued watching. And, and uh, when, when Wimbledon was over two weeks later, I got another call from Jimmy Swan saying, are you still available? And I said, why? He said, well, Sam, Sam has been through uh, four or five assistants and fired them all, and he's still looking. <laughs> so, he, um, and I said, well, have him call me. So Sam calls me and said, can you be here in, in half an hour? And uh, I said, yes. So I went into his office. Uh, he was sitting at a typewriter. And I said, I, he I hear you want me to give you a second chance. He, he said, can you type? And I said, uh, yes. And he handed me the, the script of Straw Dogs, which at that time was called The Siege of Trenches Farm. And I could read his writing. And I had to type his, uh, retype the script. And uh, the rest is history. Wow. Was his handwriting as, as, as erratic as his personality? <laughs> you, you th you'd think he was a doctor writing a prescription. <laughs> I mean, your relationship with Sam Peckinpah was very long in, in, with regards to Sam Peckinpah's usual relationships. <laughs> I, I, um, did, I, I did uh, um, eight, films with, eight, eight films with him in uh, seven years. Incredible. And I mean, you really, you did really survived it as well. Did, there's, a, there's a story. I survived, 
survival uh, survival is uh, is a good way of putting it. Sam Peckinpah, for anyone who doesn't know, was known for very violent but incredibly almost balletic fight scenes. So the, no, the, no, 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 not not fight scenes, <laughs> not fight scenes. But <laughs> that was the best way of describing it. <laughs> I, I think I think the best way to describe Sam Peckinpah is see the wild bunch. <laughs> <laughs> Legendary scenes of um, quite violent films. I mean, Straw Dogs was was Straw Dogs ever banned? Was its release ever banned? Or was there? I know it, there was a lot of controversy Straw, Straw Dogs about. Was ban, ban, banned in England for, for fourteen years. Right. Wow. Yeah. It, yes, it was then. <laughs> yeah, and and that's. I mean, that's what. So he. he being a, di- a director like that, he was obviously a fascinating character, but very volatile. And you must have been incredibly strong. And I, I look, I look, I look back on my my years with Sam, and and I I find it very difficult to understand who that person was, me, mm. as in <laughs> really, because we we were such a we get we came from such different molds. I you know I was a a young British child of refugee parents living in England and Sam was Wyatt Earp. Do you know who yeah. Wyatt Earp was? Yes. Uh, he was a product of the West and that that combination of, of me and Sam, you know, and how that relationship survived, you know, some of the most important films of the 70s is an enigma to me, you know, to this day. And uh, where I found within myself to be able to understand, comprehend and be able to work with someone of that incredible you know mag- magnitude and yet complex and difficult person of another culture of another generation yeah of another, if it could you can call it a, ma- a match made in heaven or a match made in hell i'm not sure which it's, it's interesting that that i'm that i will always remember and and will be you know a part of my life you know i, I was second unit director i was uh assistant i was uh i was mother <laughs> I was, I was going to say it went it went beyond a job, uh, but people talk about their experiences and how the you know the old Hollywood, you wouldn't get away with that kind of behaviour before that you would now, and so many actors and actresses are coming forward and saying how, you know it was, it was pretty tough. You, a lot of actors and actresses and assistants weren't protected, and and it makes you wonder would would the kind of films have been made with that sort of much more. PC controlled working environment. I mean, to survive that as a woman, you must have a hundred percent. He must have regarded you as n- not a mother, maybe, well, maybe a mother, a sister, a, a wife. Oh, hold on one second. Can you see this? <laughs> no, I can't re- read it to me. It's a note from Sam, and it says to Katie, the mother of the straw dogs, with love, Sam Peckinpah. It's wonderful. Oh, it's incredible. It's That's. Just beautiful. And that's Hollywood memorabilia gold. Katie, the mother of the straw dogs. Obviously, so many regarded you as just someone they couldn't be without. You met Steve McQueen on Sam's films and he became your best friend. I mean, he regarded you as his best girlfriend. I mean, to even be able to say that. Steve McQueen said, Katie, you know, you're the only girlfriend I've ever had. I mean, it's just glorious. I've ever had, you know, I value that for the rest of my life, you know, to be the only person that hadn't sometimes is, the, is, is, the, <laughs> yeah. is, the, is more honor than the person that had. You to know, be an so enigma. I met Steve McQueen and Ali McGraw the same day. Steve McQueen wanted Sam to direct The Getaway. The Getaway was a film that his, his production company, which was Four Star, which was Steve McQueen, Robert Redford, Dustin Hoffman and, and uh, Barbara Streisand, four star productions. Oh, really? Steve came to Sam and said, I wanted you to direct The Getaway, which was after he had directed him in Junior Bonner, which Steve says is always said is one of his favorite films because it's about a father and son relationship. And Steve McQueen never knew his father and only found him two weeks after he died. So Junior Bonner meant the world to Steve. And Steve was so impressed with Sam's direction of the film that he asked him to direct The Getaway. And Sam and I and Steve McQueen went to Bob Evans's house uh, because Steve wanted to, to have the girl from Love Story to play his wife in The Getaway. And 
for Ali McGraw was married to Bob Evans at the time. And we went to Bob Evans's house where Sam and Steve and I first met the girl from Love Story, who was Ali McGraw. And that's when I learned that babies can swim before they can walk. Because Ali's son, Joshua, was swimming in the swimming pool underwater. And he was only wow. about six months old. And uh, did you know that kids can swim underwater? I did know. I did know if you take your babies. Yeah, I did know if you can take babies swimming and sort of throw them in and they swim. (laughs) I'm not going to try it. So Sam and Steve and I met Ali McGraw in Bob Evans's house for the first time. And who was the girl from Love Story. And um, that's how Ali was cast as, as, as Carol McCoy in The Getaway. And so I did not introduce Steve to, to Ali, but he, he wanted to meet her. <laughs> so it was on the getaway that they, that, that they, that they fell in love. And you and were the enabler. You were the enabler, Katie. I was not the enabler. I, <laughs> I was the enabler because when the, you know, when the movie was over, you know, the, the, the relationship, you know, could not continue because Ali went back to, to, to her, her, which was Bob Evans. And, uh, you know, and so the, the reason why Steve called me the, the best, you know, I'm the only girlfriend he ever had was that while we, while, when the film was over, uh, Steve wanted to, you know, Steve, Steve had a home in Palm Springs and Ali had a home in Palm Springs and with, with Bob Evans and, and every t- any time Sam, you know, they, they wanted to meet, um, Steve would invite me down to his home to be the in, in, in the interceptor. So I would I would sort of go to that go to Ali's house and say, you know, Steve wants to meet you. you know, <laughs> and the rest of it, and um, I, you know, every every weekend, you know, I and, you know I would get a call. I was the beard, you know, and and, and I would tell all my friends. I'm just going to spend the weekend with Steve McQueen, you know, <laughs> you know, and it was just, and that's when he told me, he said, you know, you're the only real girl friend I've ever had, you know, so it was. That and was, you've got uh, the most beautiful private photo collection, which, and you do share and yeah. a sneak peek of, and there's a picture of Steve McQueen in a kitchen holding a cat, yes. which is enough to make you know uh, oh i mean it's it's perfection in one tell photo you, isn't it I can, tell you the most, I, I can tell you the offshoot of that picture is classic in 1975 was uh, sam peckinpah's 50th birthday and i concocted this brilliant idea to have a uh, a party at jerry fielding's house for everybody that had ever worked with sam and every anybody on any film throughout his life, and if, if whoever whoever couldn't make it could send telegrams. In those days, were telegrams; they weren't, you know, um, send telegrams and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, I invited everybody. And um, just to let you know that the original score of the Getaway was uh, of the music score of The Getaway was done by Jerry Fielding. Jerry Fielding was one of the most fa- famous, wonderful composers of, of film music, film scores. And Steve McQueen changed it and, and it kicked out, you know, being the producer, you know, four-star productions. Yeah. He didn't like the music and he exchanged, and he, he got Quincy Jones to do a score. And the Quincy Jones score is it was in the orig- orig- original release of The Getaway. I'm a huge Quincy Jones anyway, fan. <laughs> anyway, so I concocted, I concocted this this incredible, uh, you know, big party, and um, it was going to be a surprise party, and I had to get Sam to come, you know, get to come. It was it was really complicated. So on the Wednesday, I'm in, uh, Sam and I are in the office, and I get and and it's Steve McQueen on the phone. I put the call through, and Steve said. But I don't know what he, what he was talking about. He said, um, I'll see you at your surprise birthday party on Saturday. Oh, no. <laughs> There's always one. And it has so, to, from so now anyway, on, that's going to be so, so anyway, so, uh, Sam hangs up the phone 
and says, what surprise party? And I go, oh, my God, what do you mean surprise birthday? He said, well, Steve just said you'll see me at my surprise birthday. And I said, okay, Sam. And I concocted, I rang up 30 people. And I said, you've got to come to the Formosa Cafe at one o'clock on Saturday. And it's, this is going to be Sam's surprise birthday. And, and when, <laughs> when he walks brilliant. in... When, when he walks in, I want you all to call, say surprise. And I created this lunch at the Formosa Cafe uh, for, I think it's about 30 people. And, you know, Sam walks in and, and they go, surprise. And so, oh, in the, and so, so in, and I said to Sam, you know, before you, but before you go home to Malibu, I know, I know your brother is, is here. His brother was a superior court, ju- a superior court judge. I said, can you come by the fielding house, you know, in the evening? Because um, Jerry and Camille couldn't be here and, and they, they have some gifts for you. So I got Sam to come by the house at, at six o'clock that night. And Jerry Fielding's kids were saying, um, he's, wa- he's walk- walking down the pathway. Um, he's, 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 he's with the judge. Um, they're, 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 they're approaching the house. No, they're not. They're peeing in the bushes. <laughs> and and Sam Sam walks in, and there's there's uh, I was I would say more than a hundred people, for his, for, you know, and watching him pee in the bushes with the, with, oh, with the superior court judge. And uh, <laughs> and 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 the people that were there. I mean, Bob Dylan was there. Um, Keith, Keith Moon was there. Harry Nielsen was there. Oh In fact, my God. Keith Moon, Keith Moon, Harry Nielsen, and 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 Ringo Starr's birthday part, birthday gift, and Bob Dylan's birthday gift was a Mexican door, an an antique Mexican door <laughs> that they slept in. You know, like it was. You know, and and the reason being that Sam was renowned for practicing knife throwing in whatever <laughs> office he was in and ruined ruined sauna sauna and st- you know sauna uh, in, in in the studio by throwing knives oh god they bought him this portable portable knife throwing door you know that he could carry around with him if he, if he had the urge to throw a knife Oh, I'm so glad you brought up Bob Dylan, who wrote not not knocking on heaven's door for Pat Garrett, oh, Billy Pat the Garrett. Kid. But but please yeah. please tell the story of how he didn't understand continuity. Oh uh, well, th- didn't I tell it to you before? You oh. did, but I want I want I want our listeners so to hear first our first and foremost. So. Uh, first and foremost, Dylan um, was hi- was hired was recommended by by uh, Chris Christopherson to play in the film. And he did not have a role. He had nothing. And, um, you know, and Chris said, you know, Dylan has got to be in this film, Sam. And he said, what can he play? He said, well, let's create a new character. And she said, well, what should, what, what should we call him? Well, let's call him Alias. And so Bob Dylan played this part called Alias. And uh, so he, he was in the film and he had never been in the film before. And he did not understand continuity. He didn't understand anything. <laughs> and there's a wonderful sequence where Pat Garrett and Alias go turkey hunting and they, they go around catching turkeys. And it's a wonderful sequence in the film, which you have to see to understand. And we shot the master and the full shot in the morning, the master being, you know, without close ups. And the master shot was shot. And then we all went to lunch and in the afternoon, Dylan shows up in a completely different outfit. And we had not shot the reverse. We had not shot the close-ups. And Sam said, Dylan, why are you wearing that outfit? He said, well, it's now the afternoon and the character would have been cold. And he would have worn something different. And Sam said, Dylan, this is a movie. We, we shot the first half in the morning and we're now going to show the close-ups and the reverse. And you need to be wearing the same clothes. Oh, I love it. He is you know? everything that people say. They, I mean, oh, yeah. he, he doesn't remember anything, but everyone else does. 
Oh, I could talk about, I, we could talk, well, we have done, and, and um, there's so much more that our listeners can listen to about your work with Sam Peckinpah, but we have to now talk about Blade Runner, the film that you can, you can literally mention Blade Runner and someone will have an opinion. It will be someone's favourite film. It's iconic. It's cult. And you were the executive producer. But well, by, I, by name. I, I was actually, I was not. I was executive in charge of production. Executive nice. producer is the person who finances the film. But uh, I was the executive in charge of production because, uh, you know, the reason I had that credit was that I was originally going to be one of the producers. But when Ridley brought on the wonderful Evil Powell to be one of the producers, you know, I had to step back and, you know, take a another credit but another person who's concerned about credits but uh, yeah I was I was first on the picture and the last to go. Now the film Blade Runner it's my husband's favourite film ever but the the moment for me in Blade Runner is Rutger Hauer's incredible monologue and you had to convince Ridley to have Rutger. When we, when we, were, when we were doing the original casting Michael Dealey and I and Ridley I just des- I decided that Ridley should l- at least consider this Dutch art actor that I thought was brilliant uh, called Rutger Hauer, and obviously I you know he couldn't he couldn't meet with him. But I, what I did was I showed him three films, three Paul Verhoeven films. I showed him Turkish Delight, Katie Tipple, and um, Soldier and Soldier of Orange. Um, and I showed him those, those movies, and and I said, you know, th- this guy would be an amazing batty. And uh, really, lo- really, absolutely loved the films, and um, he cast him sight unseen. And uh, the first time he met with Rutger Hauer um, was when he, he had rented a, a house up on Doheny, you know, dur- dur- during the shooting of Blade Runner. And uh, Rutger Hauer came up to 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 the to the house, and um, he was um, Rutger is is a, you know typically Dutch. He is huge, and the 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 Dutch men are really big. And uh, Rutger was very big, Rutger rest his soul. And he had you know big strong body and huge butt and uh he was wearing um shan- pink shantung pants um and a kenzo sweater <laughs> a kenzo japanese <clears throat> japanese sweater that which was white and uh, also very big and it had a applique uh fox on on the front of the sweater but then it had two red ruby eyes so you know a, a typical kenzo Typical of Kenzo, and he had already cut his hair very short and spiky, as in Batty in the film, and a pair, a huge pair of, of um, Elton John sunglasses. And and he walks in, and Ridley takes one look at at this this apparition, <laughs> and and he, and he literally went white as the, white as these walls, and he 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 looked at me, and he sort of went. Like you know, come outside, <laughs> and and he said, "Katie, what the fuck have you done?" <laughs> and I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "He's a fucking wolfter." <laughs> and I said, "Oh my god, really? Don't you see that he's having you on? Are you joking?" He said, "A fucking wolfter, you know, to play the the main main antagonist in this film." And I said, "Trust me." He ain't no wolfter. <laughs> and of course, you know, Rutger was just, just doing something to freak him out. And, and the result is one of the great performances of all time. I almost got fired. I almost got fired. Because of Rutger? Yeah, because I I'd, I'd, I'd basically he... cast, a, you know, a 300-pound gay Dutchman <laughs> to play, to play the, the replicant of all times in, in Blade Runner. Elton John. <laughs> Ridley's 
passion was the art side. He was an artist. As Remember that Ridley came up through the ranks of direction as a production designer. You know, he was, a, he was an artist and, and a camera operator before he started directing. You know, he, he actually, Blade Runner, the look of Blade Runner was his, his vision and, and Sid Mead, of course, but Ridley has a brilliant artistic eye. And in fact, I went to the, after Wickham Abbey, I went to the French Lycée, which was in South Kensington, right next door to the Royal College of Art, when David Hockney and Ridley Scott were at the Royal College of Art next door, in time as I was at, at the same time as I was at uh, the French Lycée. Oh, you know, so I hope Ridley Scott a David Hockney painting. Oh, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know if he has or not, but they, 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 we were all we were all in South Kensington at the same time. You know, Jack, Jacqueline Bissett, Jacqueline Bissett and Charlotte Rampling and I were at at, at, uh, um, <clears throat> at the French Lycée at the same time as they were. You know, I don't, I don't. I know think, we, I think we, Charlotte we, Rampling, Char- digressing slightly, Charlotte Rampling uh, modelled at the opening of my mum's boutique in Pimlico, and they had to ask her to wear knickers. <laughs> that's funny yeah but back to Blade Runner which uh, and you you uh, that that look was created without the use of any CGI oh absolutely none of that so I mean it's so that is everything it, it's all it, it, we were magic all, it was all in the back lot of, uh, of Warner Brothers and we and we shot day for night for the entire film incredible and, and the reason why we had to you know shoot uh, the last two weeks of shooting at Warner Brothers was uh, that because the director's guild strike was coming up and uh, we had to shoot two weeks in one week and we took all all the sets on the back lot of Warner Brothers and put them into closed sets so that we could shoot day for night and if we were shooting around the clock you know for one week outside you know it would be daytime and we couldn't do that so we had to we had to put the rooftop set into a closed set and that's that's why we went over budget. Maze Duel didn't have vitamin D deficiency. <laughs> I mean, you've worked on so many other films. You worked on Deer Hunter and you are a member of BAFTA. But if we can, because time is of the essence, you found yourself in uh, the world of cricket and going back to wanting to make mods and rockers best of friends, you also played a part with the LA Gangs. You're working at the Dome Village, which volunteering at the Dome Village and you were asked by... No, was it, was I, it... I, I was not only um, working, I was uh, the executive director. Executive director of Dome Village. So, and you were asked, if my memory serves me correctly, by BAFTA to put a cricket team together. No. No, is that wrong? <laughs> oh, fucking hell. As far as the cricket is concerned, I was run. I was executive director of a homeless shelter called Dome Village, uh, that was run by Ted Hayes. I met him at a at a, a conference on uh, on homelessness that was created by an organisation called Creative Coalition, which was people in the film industry involved in social issues. And he came in and said he was going to op- uh, open a, a, a homeless shelter downtown. Uh, where people live in geodesic domes and they were going to, it's going to be self-governing and they're going to run it like a kibbutz in Israel. And I immediately, <laughs> my ears popped up and I said, I'd love to work, uh, you know, volunteer. So I went down to volunteer while they were constructing the, the domes and was started off as one day, one day a week, it became a whole week and then it became a month. And all of a sudden I was the executive director of a dome village on the board of BAFTA at the same time. So I was running, spending my days in Good Row and my nights in Hollywood, you know, and trying to balance two, two unbelievable different lives. And, and that's how I got uh, Prince Edward to come to the opening of the Dome Village because Prince Edward was in town to, as, the, as the patron of the Britannia Awards that year. It used to be Princess Anne, but it was, and, and then once it was Prince Andrew. And then, uh, yes, and yes, sweaty <laughs> Andrew, and uh, and this this year it was it was um, Prince Edward. So when when Prince Edward said, you know, visited and and went into the into the domes, he said, "This is an amazing program." He said, "Next time you come to England, you have to come and visit me in my house," which was just Buckingham Palace. Yeah. Anyway, so um, the life goes back to normal, and I get a call. From Zan Rufus Isaacs, who was the captain of the Beverly Hills cricket team. And you know, there's a Beverly Hills cricket team. There was a Hollywood cricket team. In BAFTA had a cricket team. 
and I was a secretary of the of the BAFTA cricket program. And Zan said, is there, is there anyone on the BAFTA cricket team that can play cricket on Saturday? We have a game and we're short of players. And uh, I couldn't find anybody on the BAFTA cricket team to play. And I called him back and said, you know, it's too short notice. It's today is Thursday and your game is on Saturday. And uh, he said, well, can you think of anybody else? And I turned to Ted, I was in the office in the do- office dome. And I said, Ted, do you want to play cricket on Saturday? And he said, what's cricket? And I said, well, it's a bit like baseball. You run up and down instead of running around in circles. And he said, okay, I'll play. So the game was under the Hollywood sign. And uh, and I brought Ted, who, who look, looks like a Rastafarian Jamaican cricketer. And they thought I bought some, you know, some rookie. And uh, so he played that day. And uh, when, when he hit the ball, and it, of course he ran to first base, you know, <laughs> instead of instead of running straight ahead, and he said, "God, he said, cricket is amazing. It's such a gentlemanly sport. It's such a a professional sport, and it it is it's so civilized. You know, you stop for tea, and 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 uh, he said, uh, why don't we start a cricket program at the Dome Village? You know, and teach the teach the the, the men how to play cricket. I said, okay, and." Uh, I brought along uh, some of the uh, uh, cricket players that I met at that game and and uh, they started coaching cricket at the Dome Village, you know, and we, we used, you know, sort of various and sundry parts of the bit, you know, and used, used the trash can as the stumps. And out of that came the team, the LA Crickets, which, um, you know, when I, I put on my producing hat, who went on tour of in England. Uh, in 1995, with sponsors and, and all the rest of it, because um, uh, you know we took a, a few not not professional cricketers, but uh, so you know some uh, rookies at this, as they say, you know, because you know they weren't exactly professional at cricket. Uh, you know, of course, we didn't win any games because we were playing against you know c- people who've been playing cricket for you know for donkeys years in in England. Um, one of, one of the cricketers said, "You know, why why don't we start a team in, in Compton where kids are killing themselves over the color of shoelaces?" And very long story short, that's how the Compton Cricket Club started. And, and it, uh, we, it's the most we, incredible story. And we took we them saved on, lives. We took them on tour of, of England four times, and then went to Australia with them. They were called they were called the Homies and the Pops. On the fir- first tour of England. Uh, we co- we called uh, we called uh, we communicated with Prince Edward and said we're here and uh, <laughs> he uh, invited us to come down to Windsor Castle and play cricket against the uh, the Windsor Castle staff cricket team. They visited him at Buckingham Palace and I have all the pictures. And I mean, when you'd met some of these kids, I mean, they had. I mean, they say some Americans don't even have passports to leave America. I mean, these kids hadn't even left Los Angeles, had they? When you say Los Angeles. I had to drive them around Compton when I picked them up, you know, for cricket practice um, because they couldn't cross enemy enemy lines in Compton. Wow. You have met and they've played with Brian Lara, Viv Richards. Um, I mean, you've been on Test Match Special. I mean, this became a huge, huge thing. And, and most importantly, people stopped killing each other. You're like super grand, grandma, super mama. You've got these beautiful now generations of children which without maybe the intervention of cricket or a team sport you know these children may have never been born because these lives may have been cut short and you were there to make sure that these wonderful people continued because they were only there for the grace of God and I think that's what's so wonderful you and you do which is why you've got your MBE but you also worked and I know you worked in the pandemic with them as Shakespeare company in LA in a city Shakespeare yeah and that is is that that's fundamentally those those kids that would not have access to the arts normally so are these underprivileged kids that you're working well, I, with or I, I, through BAFTA I started uh film pro, uh, film programs at Washington prep you know so, so they could learn how to make movies and uh I started in in a city Shakespeare it's it's yeah. incredible because you're just doing stuff that people now are sort of saying, yeah, this is what we're doing. And, and you know, certainly in, in the pandemic, we've sort of, and but you've always been a philanthropist. It's never been yeah. about making big, massive movies. It's about using your position to help people. Well, as, as my mother would say, if you if you look in the, in the other room, you know, I've got all these uh, awards up on my walls and my mother would say, it's wonderful you've got all these awards, but... Uh, uh, what a shame you can't afford the wall to hang them on, you know. 
I mean, so, yeah. so, so that if you just look back at everything you've done from trying to bring the mods and rockers together to then helping out in an orphanage to then basically be in care of a Sam Peck in bar. <laughs> well, you know, find, finding these books that I told you about, you know, I, I, I talk about, you know, Romeo and Juliet and seeing my yeah. sides, you know, and they're the seeds of inner city Shakespeare. So that was my interview with Katie Haber, which pretty much started over a year ago. And we just chatted so much. It was a year long task to edit. But what did you think? I loved it. I thought it was brilliant. What an interesting woman. Yeah. So inspiring. It was. And you can tell that's a year's work because the, the, <laughs> the, the, the well, the research alone would have been absolutely incredible. But I think fascinating and incredible and interesting is just some of the words that sum her up, really. Yeah. I mean, and ahead of her time, completely. Doing it all, not because it's a trend or because everyone else is, but just because that it comes from the soul, stems right back from, you know, the story of her father and, and from mm. helping out in orphanages to to just culminating in an MBE for her work with, with the homeless and, and the gangs. And I mean, just... Oh, Without Amazing. any sort of form of what does want desire for recognition, you know, actually really humble and will probably hate me gushing about how incredible she is and what an inspiration she is. She's proper old school, isn't she? She's yeah. just like, I'm here to do a job and I'm going to do it. And this is my job and I don't want any accolades or anything. You know, it's just a job. I was just here to do a job and that's that. And loves yeah. it. Yeah, totally loves it. And survived it. <laughs> <laughs> it comes across in the way she speaks because there was, there was, um, she was incredibly humble and modest, but at the same time, you could hear the joy in her voice as she spoke mm. about. Not, not. It wasn't a fame thing. It wasn't. Oh, here's a name drop. It was just said so casually, but with such Almost pride her as well. Complete life. Yeah. Well, they're just her friends. You know, they were just stories of her life, and she could have been talking about anyone. You know, Bob Dylan it just happened to be an incredibly famous singer, but he, yeah. it could have been anyone she was talking about. I mean, if Steve McQueen was my, if Steve McQueen was my Stephen Garth Bailey, I think I'd be, I'd have it on a t-shirt. <laughs> well, I am basically Steve McQueen. <laughs> well, yes, Steve the Queen. Yeah. Yes. And, um, <laughs> yeah, and well, Four you've... Star Productions as well was my favourite one. Just a casual <sighs> reference of was it Robert Redford. Barbara um, Streisand. Barbara Streisand. <laughs> I remember listening to that, and I was, I was, I was walking, and as I listened to the interview, she just dropped Barbara Streisand. And I was tripped over myself. <laughs> you talk about the way she speaks, and she does speak very old school Hollywood. There's that real sort of Jewish humor drawl, that real, that that solid gold Hollywood sort of, um, you know, tough, tough, tough cookie. She mentioned a, a quote from Ridley Scott. Um, which has been publicised and, and we, the language used back then, they wouldn't get away with now um, on mm. set. And, and that wasn't, anyone was doing anything wrong then, you know, from, from, from what Katie's told us. But um, it's the way language has changed and she survived, you know, that real, oh, you know, just t telling people that they're shit and they're terrible and they're get off my film set. There was no human resources department. Or... <laughs> <laughs> but she, the, the, the thing is what I loved about her is that she's naturally very good anyway. And we, we, we can see that in her accolades, but was the fact that she overcame that sort of um, toxic masculinity by just being fucking incredible at what she did to the point yeah. where they, they they just had to bow down to her and say actually you are the best yeah commanded please, please, respect can we have you? yeah yeah through through hard work and determination and just being bloody bloody great at what she did um and i just think she's such an inspiration not just to women and not you know to, but to anybody but you know just yeah work hard and be you know be proud of what you are and what you do and you know the work will come and I think because celebrity just doesn't impress her at all, she she judges people by their heart and their kindness, and you know, then in in the, in her professional life, their talent. So you you see that on her Facebook page, you know, the adoration she gets from sort of people that are, you know, Ali McGraw, but then uh, these grandchildren of of the cricket players that whose lives she saved, and everyone gets just gets treated in exactly the same way, and that's such class. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. That's definitely. such class. That's old school class to treat everyone equally the way that you would like to be treated. I mean, oh, because, you know, money and fame goes to people's heads and it only takes one job 
for an actress be to become a monster or or what have you and <laughs> mm. and and it really is just testament to her strength of character but her her integrity yeah yeah. It's it's quite uh, I don't know if refreshing is the quite word the, the right word sorry but it's 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 energizing to listen to her, somebody like Katie talk it restores your faith in humanity it reminds you that there is there is and that there is good out there and there are good people out there um, but as you say that she you know she didn't gush over the celebrity um, but when she did get excited was when she talked about the you know the 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 the, um, the cricket. I yes. keep saying cricket camp. Oh, I love that uh, story. But those people, she oh. just, I could hear the smile in her voice. Mm. She uh, is you know, cricket as she was mama. Speaking. Yeah, oh but my she had God. such, she was so proud of what she did. And quite rightly so, but she was so proud of what she did. And that was real joy. I think, you know, she did her job. She did her work and she took pride in that as she should have done. But this, this, what she did for those kids was just wonderful. And it's, well, it's paying off still now, even years yeah. later. And all those cricket legends, I mean, for, for Jeremy, this was just a literal oral wet dream because <laughs> he is, you know, Blade Runner is pretty much his favourite film, super, super mm. geek. Convoy, I mean, couldn't believe it when I went, oh yeah, that's another one of <laughs> Katie Word. <laughs> <laughs> um, but cricket, he is, you know, could have been, could had Charles from Middlesex, you know, one of them, all the gear. And uh, the minute there is sun, he's got his zinc block out. <laughs> A true cricket <laughs> but you know Katie refers to sort of Brian Lara and Viv Richards and these are names of cricketers Dennis Compton who who thought that the Compton Cricket Club was named after him <laughs> that was funny and, yes. and, and Nick Compton Nick Compton who played for England who's now the most incredible wildlife photographer you know he's now a friend of mine on Instagram because of Katie because he's like well a friend of Katie you know you've got it I mean she's just brilliant she's like everyone's Jewish grandma she's just one Jewish mother she'll kill me if I say grandma <laughs> I love the way as well Meredith when you were talking to her and you would say oh because it's this isn't it and she'd go no it's not actually it's yeah. this <laughs> <laughs> I said to Jeremy should you edit that out so I don't look quite so stupid and it's like no that's the beauty of your no, relationship I mean yeah. she went to school with my aunt so I mean I, I've known Katie all my life so so, so to interview her in this professional on her on her behalf capacity was just such a privilege and such an honor and I hope actually that my aunt and my mom and my cousins and everyone who loves her you know she's so supportive to everyone when my cousin went and played in LA Katie was there I hope they've learned something actually from this podcast about what an incredible woman she is and can someone write a book yeah you know that was I was just about to say that she needs to write a book there needs to be a book because oh, I could have I mean. listened and listened and listened and listened. And there's so much. Stories. I can imagine. There's so much more. I mean, when Jeremy beheads my roses, it's the same feeling I got when I heard him sort of editing out anecdotes about, you know, Lee Marvin and James Coburn. And there were about four Bob Dylan. <laughs> Bob Dylan, no. The one that he just came out, I laughed so much that I had to pause to have a little chuckle when he was just said, oh no, the character would be a bit cold, so yeah, it's not, it, just, he would have got changed. Like, just, <laughs> no, Bob, that's not the point. Get a grip. Put down the spliff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we did get we did get that glorious song knock knock knocking on heaven's door from that film so the fact they created a role for him despite the, the handicap he was on, on set <laughs> <laughs> i mean he went for a jog at one I know. point across, tell that story uh, yeah well I, I i don't want to get it complete i don't want to get it wrong and if katie's listened to this and i get this wrong i'll get a phone call so but the, the, in brief whenever you're on a film location the golden hour is the same sacred hour it's when you get the best light and it literally mm. is an hour and I think they'd set up this incredible scene in Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid and just as they shot started to roll uh, Bob Dylan I think had gone for a jog <laughs> <laughs> Oh, because someone, the light was really good and, and another <laughs> mega star was running you know running us behind him taking him a coat in case he got cold or maybe it was bob dylan i don't know but either way what we're going to do is we're going to put the full feature length story on on our podcast platform over the summer holidays so you can sort of lie on a hopefully a beach 
even if it's in Blighty, and uh, be transported to Hollywood in the Golden Age. Because, I mean, there are some stories that... I mean, how she survived Sam Peckinpah, how anyone <laughs> survived by Sam Peckinpah. Oh, my God. Just his direction down, I mean, from everything to the unbelievable violence but that, that a film so almost poetically, but to, to the torturous rape scene with Susan George in Straw Dogs and... Mm. I think, you know, the, 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 sh the, the way it was shot, because you didn't, see, it was more left to your imagination, which I think is 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 um, what makes... What makes it so haunting, probably. Haunting is the word, yeah, and powerful, of course. Mm. But these films, you know, the way they didn't have CGI, they didn't have health and safety. No. They, you know, they had to rely on the golden hour. Um, so... Oh, God, I mean, just, just... Talking about Blade incredible. Runner, actually. Yes, let's... Um, so it's set in 2019. Isn't that weird? Yeah. <laughs> so we, we've now outlived it by two years. We've, yeah. That isn't yeah. that weird. Yeah. And, and I still um, think it's a far better film to the 2049. Well, it's yeah. not even a different league. No comparison. No, it's... it's yeah, I... I my husband reminded me that I had seen the 2049 version, but um, I hadn't made it to the end. I think I'd fallen asleep. But... Um, yeah, we rewatched the final cut version of Blade Runner, and um, my husband Roger was telling my husband was telling me that it's based on the uh, the Middlesbrough skyline. That opening scene, he because yeah. that's where he's from, Ridley Scott. He wanted it to look like um, the Middlesbrough skyline, which um, I thought was an interesting, an interesting that, fact. And did you know that? Van Gelis that did the music mm. was um, really good mates with Demis Roussos? Oh, I love Demis Roussos. There and they were in a band. Like, no. Oh, they were in a band brilliant. called The Four Horsemen. Well, yes, Vangelis is Greek, of course. So, yes, I guess that would, but I should know this, shouldn't I? I think I it was like a Greek babies. prog rock oh. psychedelic sort of band that they were in Oh, together. I bet it was brilliant. Well, that was the whole vision, wasn't it, for Ridley Scott? He, his art, he, was art, he, did art, he was an artist. He was at art school with... Um, David Hockney, Hockney mm. controversially involved with the London Underground artwork at the moment. So, yeah, everyone can see a bit of Hockney at the moment, whether whether you think it reflects Hockney or not. But uh, that can wait maybe for, for next a, week. For maybe another for next conversation. Week. We'll chew yeah. the fat on that, that uh, representation yeah. of British art. But Hockney went to art school with Ridley Scott and he, you know, he was an artist and he had a vision he had an absolute vision he knew that that had to be that music and down to uh, there's a there's quite a few um fan forums quite a few i mean there's billions of fan forums for blade well Runner. it's a cult it's a cult it's film such cult. And the art is the big thing you know people sort of draw paint and submit art and discuss the art and down to the shape of the whiskey bottle there and there's so many conspiracy theories about it which i love so you've got all these people talking about why was the bottle that shape and why was such the and such? whiskey what shape was the whiskey? i just remember a I whiskey think glass Geomet being Geo quite oh, sort of sort of art deco sorry the glass i think it is yes the, oh yes um, okay yeah art deco exactly that but which i guess is middlesbrough's sort of um era is is middlesbrough art deco sort of uh, industrial kind yeah, of yeah i think so isn't it but if you think of um yeah if, if you look at the whole film so so the uh flat where um he lives in that building um was it's called ennis house and it's in la um and it was built in 1924 designed by frank lloyd wright i think who also designed the guggenheim and that those concrete slabs they're very distinctive mm. and they're quite art deco and um What's the woman's name in it with the dark hair? I've forgotten that Sean character's Young. name. That's Sean Young, that's it. Her character, she looks like um, um, Rossellini. Is it Rossellini? Rossellini painting. Rossellini. Oh, God, what's the uh, artist uh, called? But Bocelli. No, not no, Bocelli. No, no, not Bocelli. No, no, absolutely yes, not. The she didn't have a bum she's almost um, it's, it's Rossellini. androgynous, sort of that. Uh, I don't think she's androgynous. She's you know, very feminine. Oh, I think she's. I mean, she's I, almost. I, I, I think replica. You, but you know, the whole is she is she not a replicant? Is that's part of that look, isn't it? That that stylizer. Apparently, Grace. Ch I don't know if this is true. I read this. Katie hasn't confirmed this to me because I read this yesterday. Apparently, Grace Jones was up for that role. Oh, was she? Interesting. Mm. I can see her in that. Actually. That's what I mean about the androgynous thing. Do you yeah. See now, me? Grace Jones. I think Sean Young is quite an androgynous mm. looking person. 
I don't know, but in the, I thought she was very feminine in that role. Rossetti, that's the word I was Rossetti, thinking of. Rossetti, yeah. She looks like a, I, she just reminded me of a Rossetti woman, like the Cupid bow lips and the hair and, you know, mm. the bright red lips. It just reminded me of a Rossetti, which is... Um, well, Stephen thinks um, Rutger Hauer is a piece of art, a masterpiece. Oh, he is beautiful. Those, all those colours on his face, that oh. blue of his eyes and this sort of really icy white of his hair. And that story, the story, I mean, oh, it's t- uh, it's t- it I mean, we don't <laughs> use language like that anymore. Thank you, Ridley Scott. But um, that story, which, um, uh, what, did you take? what did you I... take from it, Stephen? <laughs> 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 what did you say about Rick Hauer? D- big, I, I like big I... Dutch butts and I cannot lie. <laughs> I just, you know, when you're you're listening to something, and you're you, I think you are subconsciously listening a lot more than you realise. I thought hmm. I was because I was walking through the high street, listening <laughs> on my phone, on my headphones, and I was almost brought to stopping when Katie describes uh, Rutger <laughs> as <laughs> broad Dutch with a big butt. And I was just floored momentarily because I, I I remember him in the film and obviously he he's, he sort of spiked my interest at a young age, but it was that just oh, spiked your Dutch interest, big, did you guess? yeah, yeah, <laughs> but broad up. Dutch with a big butt, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Not and the fact he camped please. it up, I mean, he was winding Ridley Scott up, and I mean, these were the days when you know because obviously we we don't say woofed now, do we, Stephen? But do you think it wasn't meant in a in a, it was more, it, he didn't befit the character, wasn't it? I of, think of well, what he had in mind. I think if we look at the word, that particular word as a description, it, it sort of falls under the pansy or uh, fairy mm. kind of category, which quite often is used to describe a man of homosexual nature. But I mean, I now know a lot of heterosexual men who would probably <laughs> fall under the same banner. <laughs> yeah. um, but I loved, I mean, I loved how angry Sam and it made Chinos him. always make me think of it. Yeah, <laughs> Sam and Chinos, no socks and boat shoes. Um, I what I loved about it is that Rutger clearly knew that he was going to antagonise him, and that that brings me so much joy. But it was just the description. I could hear Katie. I could Katie was talking about the the Kenzo sweater, and the glasses, and I could see it in my mind's eye. And I just it, it sort of almost had don't don't take the wrong way. It had kind of an Elton John vibe about it. Like oh, I've, I when she I'm told me that to, story, I picture Elton John. Mm. Yeah, she, it was like 100%. I'm going to do as much as I can to yeah. to to get a reaction, and that's what I took. That's what I loved about. That story. Bearing in mind, Ridley Scott, you know, was um, a Brit, so deemed deemed you know uptight, and you know, he he not a very clever guy, and already a very established actor. And she also bloody saved that film. I mean, without Katie, that film wouldn't. I don't think. Well, we know would not survive. I mean, the the relations on set. um, If just just in brief, it is that Harrison Ford had come from. Raiders of the Lost Ark, Spielberg, who was on set, directing, hands-on, true Hollywood. Ridley, it was all about the art, the direction, and he was at the back of a camera. You know, he wasn't directing. Um, And Harrison struggled with that, and uh, there was various... uh, There was a bit of xenophobia, uh, saved by a T-shirt. But, I mean, she just... She just was a very... I mean, she could work for the UN, I think, Katie. (laughs) (laughs) I think yes, that's her role. That's her yeah. next role. Yeah. Oh, to, bless to her. Is she still working? That. She never stops. She's doing. Um, I'm not allowed to say what she's doing, um, but she is doing. I mean, she's yeah, she's making movies, and she's involved I, in the Inner City Shakespeare um, Company, and they've oh, yeah. uh, just done Midsummer Night's Dream. I'm not sure what's next, but I mean, listen, we're going to keep on putting things on our socials. We'll put all Katie's links, her YouTube channel, her TED Talk. Her socials. We'll put it all on the on the show notes so you can find it because there are stories that you must. There are just so many facets to this incredible woman. Mm. Um, I'll stop because she will hate this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yes. this is not this is not gushing in the soft sense. This is just saying that they're I know fucking you, impressed. <laughs> yeah, well, no, but it, for you it's your job, but for us, it, you bring us joy and pleasure and you know and, and everybody so you know we all benefit from this kind of thing mm. whether it, you know it's inner city cricket players or you know whether it's a film that we love just get going back to when um, we sort of skirted over steve mcqueen and you should never skirt over Sk- steve mcqueen for 
<laughs> for those kind of reasons. Um, Stephen, were you were you named after Steve McQueen? Because I know you like to tell us that people have told you not once but twice. Well, I no, I thought I really do think, and this is before I even knew that anybody had uh, commented on your uh, likeness to Steve McQueen. I was looking at the photos um, of you know back in the day when Katie was working with him. Um, Meredith had sent through some pictures, and I was just looking at some others online. I thought, my God. Him with the him with the cat, it's like Stephen with Max. <laughs> he just looks like Stephen. Ah, Stephen. Yeah, I think it's that you know little bit of um, stubble. Yeah, mm, the cheekbones. You ah, oh, Steve. Ah, oh, Steve the Queen has got some lovely cheekbones. Mm. <laughs> you do look like I him. I was I wasn't named after Steve McQueen. But I have certainly <laughs> taken on perhaps some physical attributes. Thank you very much for pointing that out. You did that, that photo shoot for the Radio Times, Stephen. Now, last night I, I told you we were we were something Stephen never ever ever does. I promise you this. I promise you this. But I sort of made him do it to Google the worst story about yourself. But we came across <laughs> <clears throat> we came across the photo shoot which I think you'd done for Radio Times, hadn't you? Just before the final. Yeah. I didn't realise either. I mean, I did, but I'd then forgotten that Pr the, the year that Stephen won was the year that Prue Leith tweeted the winner. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, she, I she tweeted the winner by mistake. Yes, yeah. before it um, went out. <laughs> and Steve, yeah. <gasps> Prue Leith and um, what's his face? Oh, why have I forgotten his name now? Noel. Paul Hollywood. My future husband. <laughs> no. What, we Hollywood? were just talking about him. Steve what, McQueen. McQueen. No, the other actor. Prue Leith and Steve McQueen. Bob Dylan. Rick yeah. Oh. yeah. Prue Leith and Bob Dylan are just <laughs> cut from the same cloth, aren't they? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think uh, Noel Fielding's cut from a similar one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> and Harrison Ford. Um, but, yes, yeah, so that was the year that... Uh, uh, why are we talking about Bake Off? Oh, yes, but the, the picture... There's a picture of you in the Radio Times... Well, I never. You're in a sort of Steve McQueen get-up. Have you got your top off? I'm going no. to put it on socials. No, no it's, he's in. He looks. Well, he, my son said it was Steve and ever in Greece. <laughs> it's like no, that was Toby Anstis. <laughs> I was. Um, it was. I'm trying to think. Every year for the baker, I'm looking at the picture now. I have it on my wall next to my beautiful oh my duvet. plant holder. Thank you very much, Hayley. <laughs> Sorry, oh, what was that? Sorry, I spoke over that. What was that? Your, your... I, my, my Radio Times uh, No, 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 your return of the macrame. Your return yeah. of the I'm trying to talk now. Oh, right. <laughs> you know. He's trying to get the words out. <laughs> Honestly, it is like talking to Judy when she's had a drink. Pipe down, have a tic-tac. Um, my beautiful... <laughs> My Radio Times cover was framed for me by the Radio Times and presented to me by Stephen Fry, none other than. If we're going to start name dropping today, I've got to try to yeah. find some. But it hangs beautifully next to my uh, gay pride macrame plant holder, made for me by the incredibly talented Hayley Clapham. <laughs> so oh, I just and they are. We've all got one. one. Yeah. It's I've got to go and uh, find a plant pot and a plant that I won't kill. Just get a plastic one, babe. Yeah, I think plastic. I'm going to. Yeah, all the students have got you that. You watch, you'll kill that too. I will. Yeah. Oh, well, won't dust it and it'll just go grey. Yeah. <laughs> you were the ideal recipient for one of those, weren't you, Mers? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know what? I still got my peace lily from the 90s. And I think it's had about three lilies since the 90s. <laughs> in, in 20 years. <laughs> those are my waves of good luck <laughs> and peace. <gasps> No, they're brilliant. Um, Check out our. Uh, in we'll put that in the show notes as well. Haley has, Haley has discovered. We were all talking about self care and things we do, and I think you mentioned, didn't you? You just got into macrame, mm. and my God, there's no stopping you. I just can't stop knotting. No, and we I'm, had such I'm a laugh thinking mad. of thinking of names, but it is uh, return of the macrame. <laughs> return of the macrame. Stephen's got a quite... pride one. I love my pride. It's beautiful, and it, I, I'm not a plant daddy. I didn't. I didn't fall for that sort of. Um, I didn't go into that last year and I don't have enough hair to bleach it and I didn't get plants. But now I've got that one. I think I want them everywhere. But they are, it's a bit of a, I had to hang that out of the way because I am a head butter. Um, uh. I'm just sort of revealing some my private sexual life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I need it to be out of my, out of danger's reach. So it yeah. hangs beautifully there. And I, I just, I stare at it like it's a, uh, like it's a newborn child. Yeah, it's I'm so, so pretty. Happy. 
Oh. There's something about things that are suspended. I would never go across a suspension bridge, but I'm fascinated. You can't by see them. in the picture, but the, the sex swing is just out of sight. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I'd love no, is a it a swing chair? <laughs> I can make you. I can make you a macrame one. Oh my god! It's can you imagine? <laughs> what I loved about my macrame plant holder was not only did it come from our Haley Clapham, it is it was handmade. Yeah, and with love. there's something very, very special about that. I get sent lots of uh, things from companies, you know, various bits and pieces, and I think, oh, that's nice, thank you very much. But this, I think I'd had a bad day when I opened it, and I was so touched. Um, still took me 24 hours to say thank you, though. Oh, I know, but you left a beautiful message, though, Stephen. It was so lovely. I think and that, just and fa- that message was ju- just it filled my heart with joy. So thank yeah, you. It was he, an absolute he was pleasure. genuinely touched because he then told me to say he'd received it and he'd cried. And I think oh. we, Jeremy received his and cried. So, oh, uh, oh God. we like that. We we a pair uh, of we are, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nicely done. Nicely yeah. done. I mean, we could talk about Katie till. The cows came home and we have done, haven't we, off air? I mean, she's just been, I've been spamming you with photos from her incredible private collection, which she's very generously allowed us to share some. And um, I mean, she's, there's a picture of her riding on a bike with Steve McQueen and they were singing Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head from mm. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And, you I know, it's that, just man. that magic, that absolute magic. And... <laughs> She's still and, friends um, with Ali McGraw today. And, I and just Steve think McQueen so and Ali McGraw um, secretly were having uh, a bit of a they fling, were. weren't they, yeah. um, on set. And then she left her husband, didn't she, for him? Well, Bob, I, is it is it Bob Evans? I'm just Googling it now. Bob Evans, director. Um, Rosemary's Baby, Love Story, The Godfather in China. Yeah, Town. so Love Story, that's right. He directed yeah. her in Love Story. Um, they wanted the girl from Love Story, so they fought, tried... Uh, Four star was it? Four star had Four the star. meeting mm. and went to to um, meet Bob Evans. They took Steve McQueen to Bob Evans's house to meet his wife, the star of Love Story, and the rest is history. Yeah, unfortunately for Bob Evans, it's a little bit. I mean, I think the whole thing of Hollywood is a little bit incestuous, but I, you can see why though. You know, they they're in the, they live each they live in each other's little pockets and. Mm. Yeah. But you know. I I found my soulmate second time round, and sometimes when you know, you know, and you know the stars collide, don't they? And it's all just wonderful. And Ali McGraw and Steve McQueen, I mean, that was a love story in itself. I mean, beautiful love story. I've seen some just Polaroids of them together, just natural, and just the most beautiful couple on the planet. I mean. I love Love Story as well. Um, that the, the music from Love Story, just thinking about it now, I'm crying. And also the music from Deer Hunter, another film Katie was involved with that got the Oscar and, and got the Oscar the year of Midnight Express and, and John Hurt. I mean, oh, just, I mean, what the, the pedigree and then a member of BAFTA as well. Yeah, so, amazing. Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, mm. just incredible, incredible. I did ask her if... Um, She'd got the general announcement about Noel Clark, and uh, she did. What did? Um, what were her thoughts on that? Um, she didn't. Do you know what? She didn't really have a comment. She hadn't. She hadn't um, been aware that that aware of him and what had gone on. It was. It just happened when I spoke to her. And it obviously, her, it was mm. eight in the morning, I think, when I spoke to her. But um, and and in her uh, heyday in Hollywood, did she mention about that sort of stuff happening? Uh, no, actually, do you know what? And uh, no, I don't, I don't. And I think she, she would have, I didn't ask, but Katie and Katie's very honest and truthful. And there's lots of stuff we've discussed, which, you know, we is private and nothing salacious, but you know, needs to remain private for respect of, you know, stars and what have you. Um, no, uh, honest to God, she never, mentioned anything to me that she'd experienced not to say it wasn't mm. going on but i think like i said that the environment they were in having katie on set mm. you know having a strong woman on set 
that's why it was such a, crim a crime that there weren't more women in film actually in charge and not just the talent. And I think that's why we're now seeing such a huge shift now. I mean, we needed the Me Too movement to happen for, for, for that to, to catalyze. But, you know, there are so many women now in film making films, Emerald Fennell, um, who I found out was Theo Fennell's daughter. I did not know that. I should have thought it actually, but I love, I was obsessed with Theo Fennell jewellery in, in the 90s. Anyway, I digress. But you know, Theo Fennell and, and, and all these women, um, the director of uh, Nomad. Mm. Um, so I think having women at the helm means this shit doesn't go on. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, that's why, you know, Katie was pretty much the mum of the sister, the wife, she was everything, but I don't think any shit went on under her watch. I just, like I said, we, she, you, you said it, Stephen, she just commanded respect. And I mean, mm -hmm. she just, um, Sam was a real, I mean, he was a gunslinging, he, he shot at her once. I, he shot her when she was recovering she from was, an appendix. Yeah. Sure. So he, um, <laughs> wasn't, well, he wasn't known to be having, you know, a, a, a great bedside manner or what have you. And, but Katie, um, needed her appendix out and Sam basically said come and recuperate with me <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> relaxing you, yeah you sure <laughs> uh, come and recuperate with me and in the night I think she got up to go to the bathroom and of course Sam probably in a drunken stupor possibly um, in a whiskey haze woke up <laughs> or something fueled haze woke up thought there was a burglar and shot at her oh my god uh, where, where was she injured uh, she wasn't injured. He didn't hit her. He got her. Uh, oh, okay. He got her. But I mean, the fact that after the party, they bought him a door to throw his knives at. I mean, that kind oh, I of love pretty that story. That, that that is, really? <laughs> oh, my gosh. That really sort of does uh, describe Peckinpah. But I mean, I think she had to wake him up once. He'd fallen asleep and she woke him up. I mean, and, and a lot of people do do this kind of, our dog even does it like, oh, fuck it, what was that? Sort of yeah. socked her in the face. And um, oh she left and asked the doorman, I hope I've got this right, Katie. Please don't tell me off if I haven't, but there are so many stories. And, and the doorman of the hotel said, shall I get you a cab? And she was like, yeah. And he was like, oh, my God, you look like you've been in a Sam Peckinpah movie. It was like, <laughs> <laughs> irony. Yeah. It wasn't a movie. <laughs> but, I mean, the stories, the stories, the stories, the stories, and not just of celebrities, of stories of her neighbour's parrot in Hollywood. And this is why she needs to write a book. She does. So we can all read it. Yes. Well, I could talk about this for hours, but we have got to go. And I am going to, for once, say a very short goodbye because it's been a lot of my voice this show. So goodbye. 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 Oh, fuck, I really wanted to say it's the last episode next week. Oh, shut up. <laughs> thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. And thank you so much to Katie for being such a wonderful guest. We're going to put all the links and details in our show notes. And we can't wait to see you again for our final show of season one. That's another good theme tune. Talking of uh, deer hunter, love, love, love story, and night rider. <laughs> <laughs> All on par with one another. Oh, I used to love um, the theme tune when I was a kid to The Littlest Hobo and I still oh, know all the words. Maybe tomorrow There's I'll a place that keeps, keeps on calling on me. me. Down Shall we down sing out on it? Yes. Yeah. yes. Well, yes. Okay. Ready? Let's start again. One, okay. two, three. There's, There's a, a place, place that, that keeps on keeps calling, on calling me. me down, down the road. road. That's, That's where, where I'm gonna be. be. Every step, Every step I, make, I make, I make a new friend. friend. Oh no, actually, I just forgot that next around, one. Don't turn around, don't turn around, I'm gone again. The week we Maybe don't have a singer. Maybe tomorrow, tomorrow I'll the week just we don't keep have a singer. <laughs> Until tomorrow, oh, yeah. I'll, I'll just, just keep, keep moving, moving on. on. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Natalie. Poor Natalie. Not only does she not um, have um, 
a mic. Wi-Fi. To, 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 Wi-Fi for the recording. She's had to endure us fuck, <laughs> fuckers singing. Mm-hmm.